probably heard of this guy, Karl Popper. He's the guy who came up with the concept of non-falsifiability, which I want to talk about today. Uh, he was reacting in part to Freud. Um, you could ask a Freudian, well, what about this case or what about that case? And a Freudian would always have an explanation. He could explain everything. And Popper noticed that, well, if you could explain everything that could possibly happen, you don't really have much of a theory at all. Popper called that non-falsifiability. If there's no way to make a theory false, then it predicts everything and therefore predicts nothing. So for me, the real question is, why are some outcomes more likely than others? And Popper is in my pantheon of people who are taking an unusual approach to that question. You know, why is there something instead of everything? Um, and it's, a, it's really important. Some of the biggest insights we've had in science have come from people paying attention to that relationship, the relationship between what happens and what doesn't happen. What's presented is a product of what's prevented. That's the approach that interests me and is applicable to the work I do on the origins of life. Uh, basically, how change changes, such that at the origins of the universe, we were really unlikely, but possible, because nothing we do violates the laws of physics and chemistry, and yet here we are, very likely. So how do likelinesses change? How do unlikelinesses change? What doesn't happen is as important as what does. It's a great Sherlock Holmes story about it uh, in which the, the, the clue was the dog that didn't bark. So the people who in this pantheon are curious about processes of elimination. And um, basically, why is there something instead of just anything? Darwin is a classic example. The creatures who are presented today, he realized, were a product of the creatures who were eliminated or didn't make it this far. Uh, the fundamental concept of the second law of thermodynamics, the first explanation we have for why things tend to fall apart, came from a guy named Ludwig Boltzmann, who noticed that disorder is much more likely than order. The basic concept by which we think about computers and what uh, we call information, though I want to suggest that it's only part of information, comes from a guy named Claude Shannon, who did exactly the same thing. We, we talk about bits and bytes of information. Well, what is a bit of information? According to Shannon, it's uh, a reduction in possibilities. Uh, if before coin flip, there are two possibilities. Uh, the information that comes from a coin flip is the those two possibilities turning into one actuality. So it's a reduction in possibilities. Most researchers seem to me more like coal miners who have the headlamp on, the, the materialist bias, which is you look at what's presented and they don't think about what's prevented. They don't think about what's in the dark. They look at what they can see and they see what's presented, not what's prevented. So those people in my pantheon, which includes Popper and Darwin and Shannon and Boltzmann, um, a few others, a guy named Ross Ashby, who studied self-organization, were all paying attention to how when some possibilities become less likely, other possibilities become more likely. So that's where Popper fits in, into my worldview. And this idea of non-falsifiability is... Um, it's a brilliant one for science, but that's not our heart's question. We're not trying to avoid non-falsifiability. We like non-falsifiability. Think of the popularity of phrases like, it's all God's will, or um, that's the universe trying to teach me something, or everything happens for a reason. Try to come up with an example of something that would contradict that. Those are non-falsifiable theories, and we love them. We eat them up. Why do we love it? Because we hate to find out that our theory is wrong. We would rather be the invincible man wearing the invincibility cloak. That's what a theory like God's will, it's all God's will, actually boils down to. And if you look at Trump and his followers, they are total non-falsifiability freaks. That is, they are acting nonstop invincible. They're doing something that is also common enough in the sciences, which is if your theory doesn't explain everything, you can always add more caveats. Sometimes we science philosophers types 
call those epicycles, after Ptolemy and Copernicus. They were operating on the assumption that God would work with the perfect form, which is wheels. And they're trying to understand the movement of the planets and the stars. Um, and so they, they assumed that they needed to work with wheels. Um, and so they would have wheels within wheels. That's what an epicycle is. Um, and uh, you end up with a lot of wheels when you do that. Now, I think there's something about the human emotional system um, that would have evolved a kind of placebo attraction to those kinds of invincible theories that would allow us to add more and more wheels. So you can end up with volumes uh, of religious caveats, religious epicycles, um, or a, in astrology you see this. Um, and you also see it in homeopathy, or at least I did because I was married to a homeopath for a while. Um, and homeopathy is a, a classic example of a non-falsifiable theory. Um, whether it works or not, I'm, I'm setting that aside. I don't happen to think it does, but it is a non-falsifiable theory. If you give someone a homeopathic remedy, there are three basic possibilities. One is that the remedy will work and that proves that you were right. Another is that it will aggravate your symptoms, which they call an aggravation, and that's also confirmed. That is, the remedies either make you better or they make you worse. See the non-falsifiability? And of course, if it does neither, you can say, well, you got the wrong remedy. And the, the, the homeopathy has these enormous volumes of books, which I think of as placebo cerebrals, just like the astrologers do, just like the religious do. Now, I wrote an article about this for Psychology Today a while ago, and one of my, uh, my ex-wife's friends um, wrote to me livid. He was livid in the comments section. He was just furious at me for attacking homeopathy. He had written over 25 books on the subject. And what was fascinating was that he argued the same way that a Trumpist does. I mean, he's a decent guy. He's a liberal. Uh, he likes RFK, but never mind that. He, um, he, is, he was just certain he was right. That's the invincibility cloak that I'm talking about. And I also find it ironic that homeopath means same feeling or same pathology. And I'm saying we all have that potential to want our invincibility and our invincibility cloak. Here's another example, Noam Chomsky. Interesting, wonderful guy in politics. His linguistics is incredibly simple and kind of pathetic, if you ask me. It's the kind of thing that an eight-year-old would come up with. So um, he's operating on the assumption that evolution works in modules or the cognition works in modules. So you have modules that do different things. And uh, he's writing at a time when people were thinking were behaviorists and they're trying to figure out how uh, kids learn language. And he made the argument that language is too complicated for kids to learn. And therefore, he simply posited that there's a syntax hardware module in our brain, a language module that just evolved by happenstance. Um, so you, it's basically hardware that runs the software you learn uh, in your local language. You just plug it and chug it. Uh, you know, you have the syntax is kind of built in. A bunch of researchers went out and rolled up their sleeves and they were trying to figure out what are the rules, the laws, the symbolic processing that a computer-like language mod module does. And as they got into it and tried to incorporate all language into this universal grammar, they kept on finding um, syntax exceptions and they, and they kept on coming up with epicycles to cover it until they had more and more rules. He has since moved on from that to another theory that I find equally facile, but um, that's the kind of thing that the heart wants to do, would like to be invincible. Once you've got a theory, you want to hold on to it. It costs a lot to change our minds about things. And not only that, it, the sense that we have to change our mind makes us anxious and kind of avoidant. So, of course, we would like our invincibility cloaks and to feel invincible. Um, who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want to feel right no matter what? Whether it's a Trumpist, a homeopath, an astrologer, um, uh, a linguist, uh, a theologian, or me, or you. It's a human thing. So I, I hope you're interested in this difference between non-falsifiable theories and falsifiable theories. Um, 
And uh, the non-falsifiable ones have a whole lot of human heart appeal 